The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Amidst this pandemic, other pressing issues have faded into the background somewhat, but that doesn't mean work stopped on those things such as confronting climate change. Tonight, former Toronto Mayor David Miller makes the case that cities can solve the climate crisis. Then, a close-up on ongoing efforts in Hamilton to build better environmental practices into efforts at urban renewal. It's Monday, October 19th, and that's next on The Agenda. We have often heard it said, municipal government is the level that's closest to the people. Does that make our cities uniquely placed to do something about climate change? Former Toronto Mayor David Miller has devoted most of his post-political career engaged at the global level with such questions. He discusses it in his new book called Solved, How the World's Great Cities Are Fixing the Climate Crisis. He is Director of International Diplomacy at C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, and David Miller joins us now from the High Park area of Ontario's capital city. And uh, your former, your worship, it's good to have you on our airwaves again. How are you doing? Uh, thanks very much, Steve. It's obviously very strange times for everyone, but uh, my family and I are holding up pretty well. Uh, appreciate being on the show. Glad to hear that. I do want to start with your rather provocative title, which you acknowledge in the epilogue is a bit cheeky to put out there. But um, when we keep hearing every day about how if we don't do this and if we don't do that, we're going to lose the world because of climate change, and you entitle a book about climate change solved with a check mark through the O, it does make me prick up my eyebrows. So what are you getting at there? Well, what I'm getting at is most of the world's carbon emissions are in cities. And amongst the biggest cities of the world, there are real solutions happening today not waiting for new inventions, but actually happening today, that if we did it scale quickly across most cities, we would get the world back on path by 2030 uh, to do what's necessary. So from that perspective, the solutions are there. We just need to do them. And that's why I said uh, the, the crisis can be solved in cities because those solutions are there. They're real, they're affordable, they're not imaginary. They're not waiting for something to be invented. We just need to do much, much more of it very quickly. Somebody noted many months ago that if you look in the skies of the big cities all around the world, they, they were certainly much cleaner uh, when we were all sort of confined to quarters during the early part of this pandemic. Now, you know, nobody wants to say thank goodness for the pandemic because it brought us cleaner skies, but clearly there seemed to be a path forward there if we could adopt on a more permanent basis some of the things that we seem to have figured out in the short run. Um, what would it take to keep the good things about the last seven months with us going forward that would be helpful to the environment? Yeah, so it's, it's a really interesting point. I mean, the pandemic has been a terrible loss of life and extremely difficult economically. But we've also seen some really rapid actions from a lot of cities, Ontario cities and cities globally, to address underlying environmental issues and also social issues which have become so apparent. So from my perspective, the first thing it would take to build on what we've seen works in response to this global crisis is leadership. Uh, secondly, some money. And I think if you combine those two things, and by leadership, I mean following the example of some of the best cities in the world, um, you could make some really rapid strides, not to just to address climate change, but also to make our cities better places to live. Well, let's name names. Who do you like in terms of leadership and in what cities? Well, I think what we've seen in, in uh, uh, Lisbon, Portugal, for example, Mayor Medina, is quite remarkable. What they've essentially done is say, from an environmental perspective and from a social perspective, the pandemic has showed us uh, that housing is very inaffordable. People in uh, low-income jobs often have to live outside of the city. And we've, of course, seen that the air is much cleaner when everybody is not driving to work. So they have repurposed short-term rental housing, i.e. Airbnb, uh, as long-term uh, rental housing. And uh, the government subsidizing it to make it affordable for low-income people to actually move back in the city. 
That's a tremendous change responding to a challenge that all North American cities certainly are facing of affordable housing while having huge environmental benefits. We've seen uh, Medellin in, in Colombia actually starting to build uh, new rapid transit as a response to the pandemic, which is a little bit counterintuitive because we see transit ridership dropping. But in fact, if you want to ensure that public transit is safe, you need more of it, not less. And they're showing the way by, by leading on that. And then we've seen a whole range of cities uh, understanding that as white collar workers work from home, you need to think of the city as a much more neighborhood based place. And there's this idea of the 15 minute city, ensuring that people can walk and cycle and, and have the services they need in their neighborhood. And a whole range of cities have repurposed roads in favor of uh, active transportation, people walking and cycling. All of those things and much more are happening at a, a speed we've never never thought possible. But because they're necessary to respond to the pandemic, mayors have been able to do them very quickly. Any mayors of any Ontario cities that are catching your fancy? Well, I think, you know, this is a, a really tough moment for mayors. And I uh, applaud uh, uh, Mayor Watson, Mayor Eisenberger, uh, and our own mayor in Toronto, Mayor Tory, for their efforts um, so far just, just to respond. But I think what we need to think in Ontario at the moment is what can we do next to take the stimulus money that's going to happen, steer the federal and provincial governments to make investments that will ensure that we don't just deal uh, with the pandemic, that we deal with the climate crisis as well, because there's no point in fixing one problem to create another one. So we really need to see investments in the areas that are going to produce better places to live and also reduce greenhouse gases. And the good news is that in cities, we know what those areas are, very clear what they are. And it's clear somewhere in the world what can be done to address uh, both problems of the environment and, and inequity. I know you said this in the book that you get asked this all the time. And so I, I kind of don't want to ask it on the one hand because you're expecting it. On the other hand, I don't want to disappoint you by not asking it because you are expecting it. But, okay, here we go. Everyone assumes that because the issue is climate change that it requires um, countries, if not international institutions, to get together to solve this. And at first blush, you might not think the solutions are at the local level. And obviously, this book is designed to refute that argument. But, but what do you say to people who think, you know, we can't do anything on a smaller scale. This has surely got to be the bigger players who are going to resolve this thing. Well, what I say to people is the good news is you're wrong, which probably isn't the best way to put it. But the, the, the good news is that there are not only are there real solutions in cities, in a way they have to come from cities. And, you know, studies by the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, who I, I work with at the moment, show that about 70 percent of the world's greenhouse gases can be attributed to cities. And those are in four areas, really, uh, how we heat and cool our buildings transportation, how we manage our waste, and how we generate our electricity. Uh, the good news in Ontario is that our electricity grid is mostly clean thanks to the efforts of the, the previous government. So that's, that's good in this province. But in cities, you have a wonderful combination of having the powers to address uh, transportation, how we heat and cool buildings, how we manage our waste. Some great examples globally of, of how to do it. And also kind of what I, I would see as a bit of magic. You know, uh, cities in Ontario and towns have uh, directly elected councils and mayor. Um, there are also places where institutionally the, the governments are used to working with people and listening to them, not just because uh, it's, it's a habit, because legally they have to. For example, when you're, you're doing development applications, there's a really structural process of engaging with citizens. And most people want action on climate change. So you've got this magic combination of possibilities to act within those areas, uh, within legal responsibilities, and also able to, to influence um, other actors like other governments and, and also uh, business and, and others. And secondly, this um, willingness and ability to work directly with people and at a time when people increasingly want action on climate change, that means city governments are empowered by their residents, plus they have the tools. And that combination is unique. It's very different than federal and provincial governments who 
can make policies but are much uh, less direct and don't have responsibility for action the same way city governments do. City governments have to act. They can't just talk. They have to act, and people expect that. Let's do a quote from the book here. You say, by replicating the best and most effective ideas already implemented in at least one city, and by doing so at a scale and pace internationally, we can make a significant leap forward, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, and put the world on a path to 1.5 degrees. Now, that 1.5 degrees is a reference to what? 1.5 degrees is a reference to what science shows is necessary to keep global heating below. Um, so people probably remember uh, five years ago, uh, the nations of the world got together in Paris and reached agreement. What they said in that agreement was we absolutely must keep global heating below two degrees. But our higher ambition, which Canada led the charge for this, by the way, is 1.5 degrees. It's become clearer since then that science um, uh, requires us to keep global heating within 1.5 degrees. And what that means practically is basically the greenhouse gas emissions of the world have to be cut by 50% by 2030. It's a huge amount, 50% on a path to carbon neutral by 2050. More or less, that's what science says we need to do. And that's the basis of the book is science. Let's look at uh, some of those buckets, those four buckets that you talked about earlier, and transportation being one of them. And I note that a year ago or so, uh, the Ontario government announced that it was going to unveil a, a I think it was $28.5 billion public transit infrastructure build. Do I infer from that that you're happy and on side with that move? Well, I think building any public transit is very good. But what the the best cities show uh, are a few things. First of all, cities need a network of public transit, not just a line or two. So in Toronto's case, there's been a debate about whether we should have subways or, or use the money for other things. I think the key is um, to build a network. Ottawa's done this very well through bus rapid transit. We've seen uh, bus rapid transit in Curitiba, for example. We've seen light rail transit, which uh, some of uh, Toronto's proposals consist of. Certainly the plan when I was in office was to have an entire network uh, of light rail transit, which means um, at grade. So it's much less expensive than building a subway and you can build much more of it. That's important because people need an alternative that's reliable no matter where they go, if they're going to get out of their cars and use transit. So that's really important. Secondly, it needs to be electric based, particularly in places like Ontario that have a clean grid. You need to, to move, move public transport from diesel or gas to, to electric. So you move people out of cars onto public transport, electrify it. And that brings up the issue of buses. So uh, Toronto right now is testing 60 electric buses. It's a pilot project to make sure the batteries work in our climate. While we're doing that, and while we've been discussing it over the past several years, Shenzhen, China, has electrified its entire bus fleet, um, which is about 16,000 buses. And they've used that process to create a whole new industry. They're the, the world's leading match manufacturer of electric buses is in Shenzhen, China. And by the way, transportation is not just about public transport, it's also about private. So in Shenzhen, their taxi fleet is either electric or if it isn't quite there yet, it's on its way to being all electric. And these are things to think about uh, from a city perspective. You know, our fleets, Canada Post fleet, uh, Pure Later, other carriers, are they clean and electric? And the answer at the moment is no, they can be. You know, New York City's own fleet of vehicles has something like 12,000 electric vehicles in its fleet. That is possible today. So what we need to see is, first of all, public transit network built rapidly. We need to see that be electrified. And then we need to see other vehicles, starting with fleets, because they're the easiest. You can charge them centrally, uh, move rapidly to electric. That's all possible on today's technology. And once you start doing that, you would have the impact, uh, particularly when the charging facilities are built, of making it much easier for private vehicle owners to either take transit, walk or cycle, or move to electric if they still need to drive. What about so-called active transportation, cycling, walking? What cities in the world are doing this well, and what can we learn from them? Well, I think the big lesson is if you build a city in a way that doesn't force people to drive, so think about... Uh, 
New York or Berlin or the core of Toronto, for that matter, or uh, a lot of Ottawa uh, is built in a way that you don't have to drive, even though it's kind of spread out, as opposed to cities like Houston, where you're sort of virtually compelled to drive. People ha then have the choice not to drive, and people tend to take it. So active transportation is an important part of that. So if you think about a city growing in the future, coming out of the pandemic, uh, one of the big needs that we've seen in the pandemic is affordable housing. So can you build affordable housing in a way it's neighborhood-based and allow people to walk or cycle to their daily needs, their work, uh, buying food? You know, a lot of people have been forced to do it in the pandemic. We've seen cities really jump ahead. Paris, for example, under Mayor Hidalgo, is really aggressive in repurposing roads from cars for people walking and cycling. And, and they've been able to do much more of it in the pandemic because it's been essential because people have been working from home. That's a change combined with sort of future city uh, planning, the thinking of, of how your city or town that applies to any municipality is going to grow in the next five or 10 years that makes the city much more livable, makes health outcomes much better because walking and cycling promote good health, makes the air much cleaner, um, and creates economic success locally in neighborhoods. So it's a win for everybody. And what we've seen over the last year is tremendous strides in Toronto. Uh, they've built um, uh, bike lanes over the past couple of months uh, longer than they'd built in basically the last decade, hmm. very quickly. And they're packed. People love it. People are there because it's safe. They're, they're reserved, protected bike lanes right across the east-west artery of, uh, of Toronto. I rode them on Sunday between Bloor and Danforth. It's fantastic. That kind of thing has really positive spin-offs in a lot of different ways and, of course, provides an easy way for people to, to transport themselves around a city without polluting. Let's look at a second of those four buckets that you talked about earlier, this time waste disposal. We seem to be a very disposable society, uh, you know, by single-use plastic stuff, throw it out right away. You tell us in the book, San Francisco leads the way in doing something about this. What are they doing? Well, what San Francisco did is, is first of all, get way ahead of everybody else, um, ensuring that you had basically what we have as a green bin program, blue box. So recycling. The composting is critical from a climate change perspective because if you allowed food to decompose in a landfill, Methane will escape to the atmosphere. It's extremely bad from a climate change perspective. They've also restricted very significantly single-use products, including single-use uh, plastics. So that's the state of the art today. Uh, Ontario, you know, we should be proud of where we are in Ontario. We were early advocates of recycling with the blue box. Toronto was an early advocate of, of the green bin, as for places like Guelph and Halifax, uh, for that matter, been well ahead of the curve. The next step, and this is a place that's, that's more advanced, it's not as off the shelf, is trying to think about our economy in a more circular economy way. And we're seeing some cities like Portland, Oregon, and Philadelphia create some pilot projects, particularly on food. And, you know, Steve, this is, people will see me as the former mayor of Toronto. Uh, I grew up in a small English village and emigrated to uh, Canada when I was eight, just turning nine. And our village, everybody had a little garden. And we all had a compost heap. We grew our own vegetables and we ate them when they were fresh and they were fantastic. I can still taste fresh potatoes out of my grandfather's garden with fresh mint. They were just wonderful. And, and that kind of circularity is something we've gotten away from. We've become much too disposable. So San Francisco is state of the art today. Ontario, I, I think we, sh we should be pleased that we're kind of a B plus. B Plus, but we need to get to an A and dramatically reduce the waste we produce in the first place. You know, I've been to public meetings where people have ranted about all the unnecessary packaging. Well, that's the kind of thing. It truly is unnecessary. And we need to move away from that as a society. And I think that's going to take government leadership the same way that we saw pesticide bans move from Hudson, Quebec to Toronto and then across Ontario, we need to see some experimental ideas about minimizing and eliminating unnecessary um, packaging and other waste and moving much more towards circularity. I think that's the state of the art. And if we want to save the planet in a variety of ways, including stopping big islands of plastic from being in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, we need to move there and move there pretty quickly. I do want to follow up on that uh, you know, rather lovely childhood memory of yours. We, we live in a capital city here. 
where I think half the people live in either condos or apartments, are you saying that they can grow their own vegetables? Absolutely, actually. Uh, it's not just allotments. There's lot, lots that can be done on balconies, particularly small tomato plants. And, it, it's, and, and perhaps it sounds odd given the gravity of climate change, but if we do need to think about changing the way we consume and the way our economy works in a way that supports people. You know, Kazon City, uh, as a result of uh, the pandemic, they their biggest concern was getting enough food to people. So they repurposed industrial land in the middle of the city um, and, and for food. And it's not just people on balconies. Not everybody, I mean, uh, can, can have a, a big enough place to grow some food, but you can grow food in the city. In Montreal is doing it, uh, uh, Bronx, uh, or sorry, Brooklyn in New York. There's very significant warehouses with hydroponics. So we can change our systems quite significantly based on what's happening somewhere. And again, this is the gift of the cities. They're experimental. They have interesting ideas. Once cities see that they work, they spread like rapid fire. You know, an idea is the, the rental bikes. That basically started this idea of the previous Mayor of Paris, the Mayor of Montreal saw it, decided that their parking authority would actually manufacture bikes. The bikes manufactured by the Montreal Parking Authority then spread to New York and uh, London, England, and elsewhere, and now they're all over the world. And that started because a good, a good idea in one city uh, took place. And that's, that's the gift of what happens with uh, city governments. And it, the interesting thing is it applies to big cities, medium cities, and small towns as well. You can, you can make better buildings, you can make cleaner transportation, uh, you, you can make less waste or find ways to create a more circular economy in a small town as well as a big city. And uh, you just need to look to the ideas and do them. With just a couple of minutes to go here, I want to ask you about what, what politics allows to be possible on all of these issues that we've been talking about. When you don't have the kinds of time in office like a Vladimir Putin or a Lukashenko in Belarus does. Uh, when we have in the Democratic West elections, which replace politicians on a fairly regular basis, can you have the kind of sustained political leadership in place that can get you to the finish line that you'd like to see? I take your point about the Chinese doing all the wonderful things they're doing. They're an authoritarian dictatorship. The guy who's in charge there has been for a decade, will be for another decade. Um, it's kind of easy when you're the king forever, isn't it? Well, I, I mean, yes to China, and if, but the fact that they're, they have electrified their transportation fleet in major cities in China should be a lesson to us of what's possible. And I, I think to your broader point, Steve, there's no question that that's a big issue. And, and to me, it actually comes back to us as voters in the end. But cities are positioned very well to have a continuity of legacy. Um, and I, I think ultimately, if we as voters pay attention, you know, when I brought a climate change plan to city council, it passed unanimously. And that doesn't happen in a democratic system in a city council unless people are speaking up and saying, we want you to address this issue. Because otherwise, somebody somewhere uh, would oppose it, one of the councillors. And I think... So if people continue to speak up and care about environmental issues, we're going to see a continuity of policies. You know, when, when I left office, uh, quite famously, uh, Premier McGuinty stopped one LRT line and my successor in office stopped another one. But you know what? The third one, the Eglinton LRT, is still underway. The one that Premier McGuinty stopped is likely to get built. The other one may be. It's still happening. Why? First of all, because it was based on facts. Secondly, because there's a need. Thirdly, because people in Toronto recognize that they want better transportation. It gets expressed a bit differently, and we've seen different plans. But people are pushing and pushing. And the city, the institutions of city government support some continuity because they engage people regularly through their systems, as I mentioned earlier. And I think that gives us a hope. Uh, nothing's perfect. Uh, but if people speak up, the institutions of cities are reasonably likely to keep good plans going. And if they weren't good plans, they shouldn't be kept going in the first place. So I, I think there's a real chance. And I'm hoping if people learn what's happening in many cities around the world from my book and other sources, they'll say to their city government and their town government, 
we want more of this. We want to live in a place that's contributing to solving the problem of climate change because we know we can. And that makes us, as a resident of this city, uh, happy. Uh, and that'll make us vote for you for re-election. <laughs> That's the 63rd mayor of Ontario's capital city, David Miller, whose latest entry into this field is called Solved, how the world's great cities are fixing the climate crisis. Uh, David Miller, it's always great to have you on TVO. You give us lots to think about. We really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on, Steve. Bye-bye. The city of Hamilton has a plan to tackle climate change, which is a good thing since last year it declared a climate emergency. But like many other cities around the world, how to make sure that plan includes issues of equity and accessibility can be tricky. The hammer is no stranger to reinvention and innovation, so let's find out how its plans are proceeding. We're joined from the ambitious city by Hamilton City Councilor Maureen Wilson, Beatrice Ekoko, Project Manager for Environment Hamilton, and Mary Lou Tanner, Principal Planner at the Niagara Planning Group, formerly Hamilton's Manager of Strategic and Environmental Planning. That's them from left to right on your screen, geographically, although not necessarily politically. And we're delighted to welcome all of you uh, to our program this, uh, this evening. I want to just start by asking you, um, give us an update on how well or poorly you think the city is doing with its action on climate change. Uh, Councillor Wilson, you want to start us off? Very good and timely question. I think in declaring an emergency, you would assume there is urgency. And um, I would say COVID has um, caused us to uh, delay our that sense of urgency. But I would also say that COVID is a proxy for climate change in that what it is revealing um, and the lessons from that should inform our climate change plans. Beatrice Coco, how do you see it? I would say if we are comparing the similarities between COVID and climate change, we are literally in a co the COVID moment of March. So um, if we're looking at many scientists who are saying that basically the urgency is even just as dire. So I, I would say that we really need to take it a lot further than, than, we, are, than we currently are at. Hmm. Okay, Mary Lou Tanner, how about you? Well, I think the city's climate change plan is well thought out. However, I'm really concerned that we're not seeing prioritization and a budget attached to the items. And that's where really the rubber hits the road is what are we going to focus on and how are we going to fund it? And that is still yet to come. I don't hear three rave reviews from any of you. Councillor Wilson, uh, what's the city missing so far? I think it's missing a focus. I think it, um, if we look at those cities that have been able to um, galvanize the public um, and to move the marker, um, there are many, many things that have to be done and done differently. But uh, the successful cities are those that boil it down to three or four uh, primary themes and goals. And when interviewing residents, um, they're able to recite those goals. The, the challenge and also the opportunity in Hamilton is uh, the issue of, of equity. And that has to inform our plans and it has to inform our priorities and it must inform how, in fact, we engage with uh, citizens. So as, as you know, in, in Hamilton, we have a, a code red condition. So we have um, a 23-year life uh, expectancy difference between um, our most impoverished neighborhoods and that of our um, most econo economically uh, flush neighborhoods. And so in moving forward, we've got to ensure that that equity component is part and parcel of our climate plans. And it is a challenge in COVID in that often people will say, well, we don't have the money right now. Municipalities are under the gun. And I always say, um, we don't proceed with our budget and then tack on climate mitigation and emergency measures. Um, climate change is our budget. That must guide our priorities. Um, and we're not there yet. Understood. Let's, um, just before we go any further, and we certainly will come back to have further discussion on that, uh, you all know David Miller, the former mayor of Toronto, who's got a new book out called Solved, which is an interesting, if not provocative, title uh, on the climate issue. Uh, his view, of course, is that um, we ought not to wait around for 
uh, federal or provincial governments to solve this when he believes the solutions for municipalities everywhere are right under their noses. And here's an excerpt from the book on um, why he thinks climate change planning is important. Here we go. Sheldon, could you bring this graphic up? Thank you. In a city government context, the existence of a plan is important because it forces the system, the various departments and agencies, to act by incorporating climate actions in the everyday routine work. It is only in this way that a plan can be successfully implemented, and experience has shown that to mobilize these departments, who might not think climate change is their job, it is essential to prescribe goals for them and include them in the development of the plan. In this way, the plan gains from expert input, but also gains the confidence and personal commitment of those well beyond the city's environment department. That's a great point, but Mary Lou, I want to know from your view how realistic you think that approach is. I do think it's realistic, and I, and I have seen it work in municipalities, particularly when it comes from the council leadership and the senior management team. It is about setting goals and setting accountabilities, but it's also rewarding the behavior and the action. You have to sustain the corporate cultural change in municipalities to put climate change first and foremost. When I worked for the city of Hamilton, because of all of the uh, storms that were happening 15 years ago, we had to set up a group that dealt solely with that. And we made significant gains in dealing with managing those storms, not just from planning for it, but from operating and how we planned and had staff out on the streets even prior to a storm coming. We changed how we monitored the weather. There's significant traction on that because the leadership said this has to get fixed and fixed now. Beatrice, the way you look at it and the way that former Mayor Miller has described it, do you think that approach is being undertaken in Hamilton right now? I don't. I think we have a real issue here in Hamilton that we have this love affair of urban expansion. We're kind of expanding. Um, we're looking into expanding, growing areas that are prime agricultural lands. Um, so we really have to come have that commitment to not sprawling, so responsible land use, really focusing on, uh, you know, committing to that uh, firm ur urban boundaries. So I think that's one of the big pieces um, that we, we we don't have in the plan that absolutely needs to be there because, of course, more more area um, is, is a larger carbon footprint. So, you know, that's what we need to absolutely, in, in, in moving ahead, we have to have that piece in the, 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 the energy plan, the climate plan. Um, and I think also, with, as Mary Lou said, uh, this, the, the, the issues with, for instance, stormwater. Um, how are we? How are we actually doing it? it how are we? We need to have fair, uh, you know, fee, stormwater fees, so that those who are most responsible for producing this um, runoff get. They should be paying more for those than than the residents. So I I, I believe that there's a lot of um, huge gaps in in our in our plan so far. So that need to be addressed. Maureen, I saw you vigorously nodding your head at that. <laughs> how, how much how much consensus do you think there is on Hamilton Council right now to embrace the approach that David Miller has suggested here? Um, there's a famous saying, right? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to die to get there. <laughs> yeah. And um, climate, climate change, serious climate change action means absolutely changing the order in which we do things, um, and it must be reflected in our budget. And so to Beatrice's point, um, Hamilton is one of the few large municipalities who does not have a separate funding system for stormwater management. Um, we have many underground urban waterways that are compromised. We are beside um, Coots Paradise, which is a um, recognized internationally as a very unique um, in terms of its biodiversity. It's gorgeous. Uh, it's but just for, spectacular. It, it is. Um, there is no place like it. And we are in partnership with the RBG and others in, Royal in its management. Mm -hmm, thank you. Um, but... <laughs> We have a notion that some members of council will, will refer to the idea of stormwater management financing as a, a rain tax, necessarily um, uh, provocative. Uh, but it can't be part of our competitive advantage when we have large parking lots in which the business, uh, the, the corporate player is not paying their fair share. And that can't be part of their business model because ultimately the cost of that is being borne by uh, 
uh, residents in Hamilton, uh, and some, back to my point about equity, we have some people with the very least who are paying the most in terms of their property taxes, whether that's in their rent or in their home ownership. Um, so we have a, a long way to go on that front. I did want to clarify that RBG was Royal Botanical Gardens and not Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who has been a more famous RBG in the news as of late. So for, forgive well, the interruption. Both are there. totally awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me. This may, Mary Lou. This may be an obvious question, but um, but let's get it on the record anyway. I mean, green spaces are lovely to look at in cities, obviously, but they have a function well beyond that as well. Can you sort of fill in some of the blanks there on why it's so important to have a lot of green space in a city and the value it plays? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so green space, it holds the rainwater, it carries it, it keeps the, when it's at the edge of a creek, it keeps the creek stable and doesn't pollute the creek with runoff into it. These are areas, they consider them the lungs of our city, really. So they take pollutants out of the air, they clean the air. They are places where people can be physically active and access nature, particularly in parts of the city where there's more density. Getting into that green space becomes critically important, not just for physical activity, but there's a whole body of literature about people's mental well-being. And when we get outside the true urban areas, those green spaces are the connectivity into the city and what happens upstream is coming downstream. So if you have a healthy environment outside of your urban area, you're contributing to a better urban environment as well. And I think, you know, investing in those areas, making sure as much outside of the urban area as inside of the urban area that they are healthy, so the banks are safe, the water quality is clean, and they move water in a safe, sustainable manner is critical to a healthy city. We had a, um, my goodness, it was just an excellent program on late last night on TVO called The Life Size City. And normally, I mean, that's a multi-part series which normally focuses on some of the biggest cities in the world. And last night's show was about Hamilton. Uh, they were looking at mid-sized cities last night and they put the accent on Hamilton. And, um, well, let's look at a clip from the show and then we'll come back and have a chat, okay? Sheldon, the clip if you would, please. This street is King Street. You see that it's uh, about five lanes of traffic all in one direction. This is probably a fourth body blow we took, and I think it was 1952. They just overnight changed all the streets to one way. Oh, wow. They thought that was a great way to renew a city. Facilitate the automobile traffic, and the rest will follow. So there's been a lot of initiative and lobbying over the years to change main streets in Hamilton back to two-way it would really help to slow down traffic to create an environment where people might feel comfortable again. It was on last night, and if you missed it, it's on again tomorrow night as well. It's a, it's really must-see for people who are interested in how cities work. Um, but my, f boy, oh boy, I mean, I lived in Hamilton um, from the beginning of my life until age 18 when I moved here, and those one-way streets, I mean, people have been fighting about that for, well, for decades. So let's get into some conversation about this. Beatrice, um, in terms of what's good for the environment, what's your view on the one-way street issue? Absolutely two-way makes sense. Um, the research shows that there's more vibrancy, traffic is slowed, people are feeling more friend, um, capable of walking without fear of you know, the speed in traffic. Businesses thrive. Uh, we see, I think it was 10, a decade ago, where James Street was converted to two-way, and um, you can just see that the, the vibrancy that's happening there. I must say, though, there is, uh, in Hamilton specifically, we have, we have um, the issue of industrial trucks that are kind of barreling through through neighborhoods and i think this is a right now we're going through a, a, a kind of a, a re review of the truck route system and you know you, you'll find that in many of these cases this this kind of adds to the pressure on these streets on these one-way streets as well um it's just it's just a terrible way to it's, the quality of life is very much impacted by that kind of situation so um you know we're we're, we're pushing as environment hamilton to kind of really engage the community to and we're hearing from the community that they don't want this. They don't want this kind of, they want the, the slower traffic. They want that that, that a two-way street can bring that, that doesn't have an uh, 18-wheel industrial truck barreling along through it. So I'm uh, polluting the air and I'm really, really compromised, you know, to Mary, Mary, Mary Lou's um, uh, comment about the need for that, the, the, the uh, 
good, healthy green spaces. You know, we're talking about many areas in the city that have very poor tree canopy coverage, um, and all this combined adds to a terrible air quality. And and we really need to change that if we're, if we're going to be addressing, if we're talking about climate and environment here and livability. Well, of course, the one good thing about the one way, well, may, may, there may be more than one good thing, but certainly one good thing about the one-way streets um, is that you really can get from one end of the city to the other end of the city very quickly. And unlike in Toronto, all the lights are synchronized. So once, once you get going, you can just keep flying. Now, it's, yep. great if you're in a, it's great if you're in a car. Maybe, Maureen, yep. you could pick up the story here. It's great if you're in a car, but if you're trying to actually create a little street life and environmental sensibility, uh, not too good for that, I guess, eh? Yeah, I have nothing positive to say about our one-way streets. So let me just put that out there. You can't have a vibrant, fair, livable, sustainable city when you have um, the likes of a 403 going um, on both sides right through it. Um, so if you want to drive through your city uh, efficiently, and that's what it was designed for, and to get workers down to our industrial and manufacturing water uh front yes I, it is the most efficient way in which to move transportations but it's a way in which you can kill your city and um, it's been disastrous if it's so obviously not a good thing is there an appetite on city council to change it uh, i would say for some yes uh, for others no um, it, for many in this in the city, uh, they look longingly at the one-way streets, and I think perhaps they equate it with uh, days gone by of of prosperity and sound um, middle-class, middle-income jobs. And um, but for um, many others, uh, it's been bad for business. It's bad for air quality. It's 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 just it's just bad. <laughs> uh, get off the fence and tell us what you really think. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm just kidding, kidding, kidding. Mary Lou, um, pick up the story here if you would. We know that, um, well, you know, Hamilton has had an on-again, off-again relationship with the light rail transit system uh, for many years now. Uh, looks like the moment it's off as opposed to on, but the province of Ontario has said we still have a billion dollars in our back pocket for Hamilton to do what it wants on the issue of urban transportation. Uh, what do you think it should do? Transit. Transit, transit, transit. Our transit system was designed for the industrial bayfront workforce in the 50s and 40s and 60s, and it hasn't really had a redesign since then. The redesign is coming. It's been stalled because of COVID, understandably, but the redesign is coming, and we need to implement that. I strongly support LRT. I believe it's the right solution for the city. I believe it's the right solution to really kick off a new way of thinking about transit and connectivity and getting people out of their cars. But fundamentally, that billion dollars, which was actually $3.4 billion from the last government, they had signed off on that amount, that needs to go into transit. It should not be invested in roads in any way, shape or form in this city. Okay, if it, if, if it is transit and it's not an LRT, because that's what the current government of Ontario has said, uh, what are the options? Are we talking fleets of electrical buses? Are we talk what are we talking? You tell me. So there's a number of options. Bus rapid transit is one where um, buses get, they can have their own lane. They don't need to have their own lane. They can have queue jump signals. So when they're at a light, they go through the light first ahead of the other vehicles. It's about investing in a new fleet. Electric buses are more expensive than conventional buses. It means that you have to invest in the whole train of bad pun, but whole train of the transit system. So buying the buses, the mechanics know how to fix them, the drivers know how to drive electric buses, and that the route de redesign is done. So we're meeting the needs of people where they live and where they need to get to. I live in East Hamilton, and there are parts of my community that can't get to the Confederation GO station by transit. And if you get to the Confederation GO station, in order to connect, you need to take a bus to Burlington to the Aldershot GO station. It, it's madness. Our transit system needs a redesign. We need to invest in the full suite of transit upgrades. It includes electric buses, but it also includes connectivity to, to GO stations. It's a complete rethink that's needed and the investment to support it. Hmm. Beatrice, let me get you to uh, nudge our conversation along to another area, and we hear this expression all the time now, the 15-minute city. And we know that... Um, Governments are encouraging people to kind of work and live in their own neighborhoods where possible. 
we're getting a, sort of a, a, a quick primer course on what it means to live in a so-called 15-minute city where people are encouraged to cycle places, to be able to walk to the things that they need to walk to uh, in their neighborhoods. Um, maybe could Just put a little more flesh on that bone. Why would the 15-minute city uh, be crucial to Hamilton's development? Well, we really need to reduce urgently our greenhouse gas emissions it's like this is an, a climate emergency we have to reduce the, the, the emissions the best way to do that while building up vibrancy and, and the livability and quality of life is look at your streets right so you know if we're making it more attractive for people more convenient more healthy more fun to be able to walk to places that are really you know close to to where you're going to your local amenities whether it's uh, groceries or you know parks or whatever it is you're going to it makes perfect sense that these structures this infrastructure be be prioritized um even even within the city i'm thinking even of transit um even pre-covid 19,000 hours of our transit uh, hamilton um, street rail ha were cut before even covid happened so we have to prioritize that kind of livability within that 15 minute context, which, are, you know, you're looking at France and you're looking at all these cities that are doing that, um, uh, like Milan, there's so many cities, Bogota, they're all doing that because they understand that, that it's really about the quality of life and the, 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 the need to really bring down those emissions urgently. But Beatrice, follow up with this. Do you think Hamiltonians want this? Yes. I How do you know? Because I work with many people that, um, you know, and a lot of them, I must say, a lot of them are people coming to the city and, and, and a lot of people are kind of reawakening to the fact that this, there is an urgency, this makes sense. Of course, many people want to drive and we're not saying don't drive, but within the context of like, you know, you can be a healthier person, you can have a healthier city, you can have connectivity with neighbors, with your own community. You don't have to be driving to certain places like, like that are literally minutes away when you could easily ride a bike, right? So, or, or walk if you can. Um, so those are, so those, I think to say at this point, do they want that? I, I think it's, it's, <laughs> I don't, you have to change. There's no choice, right? Because, um, and, and to make it attractive in that way is, is kind of our, our work in a way. I think we, we have to change because otherwise we're, we're just going to, we're gonna, our missions are just going to go. We're just going to lose the chance to to recover, from, to to move forward, to have a livable future. Really, is that urgent? Um, I just keep trying to bring it back to COVID, and I'm trying to say that we are at the point where our emissions are so high. If we don't do something now, it's going to be too late. No, I hear you, but and maybe Maureen, you could pick up the story here. Um, I don't know what it is in Hamilton, but I can certainly tell you here in Toronto, if you take a subway. Um, Boy, oh boy. I mean, the subway traffic's down at least 80% uh, just because people are nervous about COVID-19. And the subway is clean and everybody's wearing masks and yet there's still nervousness. So I wonder whether your push for further embracing of public transit uh, is, you know, is that a message people are anxious to hear in a COVID era? Well, to your question of uh, do people support 15-minute um, cities or uh, or neighborhoods they may not um, but it's just because we haven't been having that specific conversation so what i've heard during this time is um, i haven't heard anybody tell me tell me that they miss their two and a half hour drive and their commute and missing their their kids uh, soccer game uh, missing the bath time and the bedtime i haven't heard anybody um, talk about um, when they go on top of the escarpment, um, they can actually finally see all the way to Toronto because our air quality during this unusual time has actually improved. Um, in the last six weeks or months rather, I haven't received a single email complaining about the state of the roads. I have received an enormous number of emails talking about green space and how come, Councillor Wilson, I have to go out onto the roadway uh, when I'm on the sidewalk. Um, right. COVID seems draconian in terms of its impact on public space because we have intentionally uh, given up public space over the last um a number of decades and we've primarily given up those slices of spaces to the car if you look down at a sidewalk you can see exactly where it starts to get a little, little narrower because we decided to put in a turn lane 
So that five second wait for that car, you've now uh, prioritized the car over the safety and the well-being and the ability of people to get around differently. So to your point, do people support it? They may not. But if you sit around and talk to people about um, despite how miserable and uh, terrible it's been during this time, it has caused people to pause and say, where am I vulnerable? But also, what lessons have I learned? And that's where a conversation about values and experiences come in. Um, and I think that's how you you build a coalition of the willing in terms of how we plan our cities and where we invest. Well, let me pick up on that. Yeah, sure. Let me pick up on that lesson of uh, on that issue, rather, of lessons learned. And Mary Lou, uh, let me go to you on this. Cities have been doing things differently since COVID-19 began. They, they, they started doing them because of COVID-19. And I'm talking now about an approach to housing the homeless or the creation of more bike lanes or ensuring that there's more walking space in the cities, um, you know, e extending uh, uh, restaurants out onto sidewalks and that kind of thing to make places more, uh, you know, people friendly. That was all done because of COVID. How much of that do you think is going to continue uh, once we get a vaccine, once we get a better handle on COVID, et cetera? Uh, certainly, I think the restaurants are going to continue. We've seen that that is a lifeline and uh, so important to their future. I think people are now seeing different opportunities and different choices that they can make and different issues in their particular neighborhoods and demanding that the status quo not continue. I can tell you where I live, we have a great walkable neighborhood. We have transit. It is a 15 minute neighborhood. We can walk to the store and people continually are very thankful for that. And now wanting to see better cycling, better transit, using the transit. But also one of the lessons of this pandemic is homelessness. And in this neighborhood, which is a 50s suburb, we have seen people living in their cars. We have seen people camping underneath uh, bridges. We have seen people camping on the escarpment. And I have seen a humanity and kindness in my neighborhood and my neighbors in supporting those individuals and just not reporting them to the city so they don't get cleared out, but saying, what can we do to help and support you? There is an empathy for ourselves and for our neighbors that I am seeing that I haven't seen in this city in the past. And I think that if there is a shining light of grace coming out of COVID, it is that, that we are seeing that we really are each other's keepers in our neighborhoods. And we have to advocate for the things that are gonna make all our quality of life safer, healthier, and better. Beatrice, what are you seeing on the empathy scale? Definitely, there are a lot of, I mean, there's an explosion. Alongside with the COVID crisis, we're looking at also the Black Lives Matter crisis, the anti-Black racism that's been exposed. So I think there's a lot of, um, I'm, I'm hopeful because I feel that people are making the links between the three crises, uh, crises or whatever you say them, um, and really seeing that we can't, we have to have that, what, what they, they're calling the just recovery. So. Um, the equitable lens for everything um, as we move forward. Um, so I feel that, yes, I feel that there is some hope in that sense that this, this COVID moment has definitely um, created a, a, an opportunity for us to see people as, you know, and, and another big thing I wanted to say is just essential workers, for instance, you know, we've looked at how, who are the essential workers in our community? Um, they are people that are, that are making sure that we have the food in stores that are bagging our groceries that are cleaning um, the hospitals as well as being helping patients. So I think there is an understanding now, broaden, a broadening uh, appreciation for people, um, but it needs to actually now be, we need to elevate and uplift people who are actually doing these jobs. Um, you know, that hero wage has been ripped off people. Meanwhile, you know, for, for grocery store cashiers and that they had the two hour increase, two dollar um, increase, and now that's been taken away and we're looking at huge um, corporations are making massive profits at the same time. So that is an issue that, that we, you know, I know it's not only Hamilton specific, but um, it's something that, that that many people are, are kind of pushing back against and saying that this is, this is just not right. Maureen, we've got 30 seconds left here. Let me give it to you and get your take on how Hamilton's doing on the empathy scale right now. Well, our product was steel, but our strength has always been people. That and, was DeFasco's um, expression. Yep. <laughs> Uh, and I think that came through in your documentary of the um, the life of a mid-sized city. 
in that it's big enough to do many things, but small enough to know who to call to get them done. Um, and so COVID has uh, this this uh, overstatement. It has revealed many things that we already knew existed. Um, and it has caused many of our neighbors to um, roll up their sleeves um, and become part of the solution. But governments certainly, and uh, as Beatrice said, private business business must follow. And if it means we have to speak to people's self-interest to do that, then there's no shame in that. Um, but what we have found is that uh, while we're all in this together, uh, COVID has affected, affected us differently because of the gross inequalities that exist um, around the world and including in Hamilton. I want to thank all three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and shining some light on this issue. City Councillor Maureen Wilson, Beatrice Ikoko, Project Manager for Environment Hamilton, Mary Lou Tanner, the Principal Planner with the Niagara Planning Group. And I'm happy to remind everybody as well that tomorrow night, 9 p.m. on TVO, if you missed the Life Size City Edition on Hamilton last night, we're replaying it tomorrow night, Tuesday night, 9 p.m. So hope everybody will have a chance to take that in. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Monday, October 19th, 2020. The public can be pretty cynical about politicians sometimes. Tomorrow we'll hear why party politics might be a big reason why. Also, could something more effective be found to replace politicians? We'll debate that too. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.